Hello everyone and welcome to today's Cambridge University Press webinar. I'm very pleased to welcome as today's presenter Anne Robinson. Anne has taught students from the ages of 4 to 84 for many years. She's an active consultant and teacher trainer for several organisations and has written and delivered seminars as well as producing web material for Cambridge English and is the co-author of three books to prepare for the Cambridge English Young Learners Tests. So she's had the pleasure of incorporating new inspiration into the third editions of Fun for Starters, Fun for Movers and Fun for Flyers. Based in Spain, Anne's looking forward to sharing tips and activities in this webinar. So, over to you, Anne. Hello, everybody, and good afternoon from Spain. Good morning or good evening, wherever you are right now. So, in today's webinar, I'm going to aim to answer four questions. Which words are useful for young learners? What things do they need to know about words? How can we go about giving them this knowledge? And can we do this in fun ways? Fun ways that will be relevant and meaningful for our young learners. This webinar will consider these questions and share tips and activities to use in the classroom with young learners. First, let me say what I mean today by a young learner of English. For this webinar, I'm going to think of a young learner as a boy or girl aged between 6 and 12 years old. And secondly, I'm talking about young learners who lev whose level of English we could describe as being A1 or A2 of the Common European Framework. So, look at the words on this slide. Do you feel that bill or driving license are particularly useful words for a child aged 6, 8 or 10? Could you type yes or no into the chat box? Type in yes if you consider bill and driving license to be important words for young learners to learn and no if you don't feel they're particularly important. Right, usually these words would not be on a word list for young learners, nor would they probably be in a course book for young learners. Our young learners students are unlikely to be asking for or paying a bill in a restaurant. And they probably won't be learning to drive yet. So these words wouldn't be really relevant or meaningful for young learner students. Now think about the word card or a card in the blue box. Would this word be relevant to someone who's eight or nine? Yes, well, probably yes, but it depends, doesn't it? Your students probably won't use a business card, so business card wouldn't be very useful for them. But if we're talking about a different kind of card, for example, a birthday card, then yes. Although it is true that maybe in the countries where you teach, people don't send each other cards on their birthday. In that case, this would be a great opportunity to show students some birthday cards. They could choose the one they like most and even make a birthday card for someone that they know. Their birthday card could be made out of paper or card, which is also a material, or they could create an electronic 
birthday card. Other words that combine with card may also be useful and meaningful for your young students. Some of you have been putting suggestions into the chat box. So we've got playing cards, Christmas cards. If they use a library or they're a member of a library, then they may well have a library card. Or if they're a member of a sports club, they may have a card for the sports centre. Or they might have a national identity card like they do here in Spain. So, yes, a card in those kind of contexts would be use, a useful and a meaningful word for young learners to learn. Now, look at these two groups of words. They all come from the topic of What's the connection between these words? Yes, jobs. They're all jobs or they're connected with the world of work. Now, which of these groups of words do you think would be more useful to your young learners? Group A or group B? Yes, I agree with you. My 11 year old students could use the words in the box in B to talk about jobs that they would like to do. For example, I'd like to be a doctor. But they probably wouldn't need to talk about looking after customers or guests or the importance of keeping the company staff motivated. So here, our focus is on jobs and talking about the future. In A, students listen to a boy called Sam speaking about jobs that he might do in the future, one day. We can see in the sentence in one that Sam doesn't want to be a dentist because he thinks it's a boring job. In the second sentence, we can see that Sam is thinking about working with ambulances. Which word might be missing in sentence two after ambulance? Is it A, farmer, B, singer, or C, driver? That's right. An ambulance driver is a possible future job for some. You don't farm an ambulance. And you don't sing an ambulance either. You drive an ambulance. A person who drives is a driver. Now, let's listen to Sam talking about possible jobs for the future. Which words are missing from sentences two, three and four? Forty-seven A. I will, or perhaps I won't. What might Sam be one day? What do you want to be, Sam? A dentist? No, I don't want to be a dentist. I'm sure about that. I won't be a dentist. I think that's a boring job. An engineer? Mm, no, 
I might be an ambulance driver, but that's a difficult job. A journalist. I may be a journalist because that's an interesting job. Or a teacher. Wow! Yes, that's a great job. Right. Now let's look at the sentences about Sam. As we saw, Sam might be an ambulance driver. But that's a. What does Sam say about being an ambulance driver? Yeah, he thinks it's a difficult job. Okay, so when we're checking answers to this, we can obviously check that students have understood the word difficult. Okay, but we want to make this more relevant, more meaningful for them. So we could ask them if they agree. Do you agree? Do you think driving an ambulance every day would be difficult? And why might driving an ambulance be difficult? What do ambulance drivers have to do? What's difficult? Okay, Emma says it's dangerous. Fernando, Fernanda says they have to deal with heavy traffic. Other car drivers are dangerous. You need a driving license. Stress. You have to be attentive. You have to drive fast. You have to yes, probably probably face dangerous situations. Responsibility. Okay, so I think you agree with Sam that being an ambulance driver could be a difficult job. Now, in sentence three. Sam said he liked the idea of being a journalist. Why does Sam does Sam say that he likes the work that journalists do? What did he say? He said an ambulance driver was a difficult job. Well, what did he say about being a journalist? Okay, we've got a big clue in sentence three, just before the second line. We've got the word "an," and what does that tell us about the word that's missing? Does the next word start with a vowel sound or a consonant? What adjective starting with a, e, i, or who did Sam, Sam say? Interesting. Being a journalist is interesting. Again, involve students. Ask, what's interesting about a journalist's job? Would you like to be a journalist? Yeah, Montserrat. Yeah, you you would meet people, wouldn't you? And Yana, you would travel, and you'd find out about a lot of different things, different news, different people. Okay, so Sam quite likes. The、uh, jobs that ambulance drivers and journalists do, but which job would Sam really like to do? Sam really wants to be a teacher. Of course, we teachers have a great job. We can tell our students. About our great job. What's great about teaching?
So having fun, educating, being with the kids. That's a good word, Olga. Inspire. Everything's good. I'm glad to hear it. <laughs> yes, we meet lots of great children and they lo learn lots of things in our classroom. And sometimes you meet an old student in the street and they thank you for teaching them English. It's a great job, isn't it? Now, let's look at another way of involving students. If you look at A, we don't have a picture of Sam. You heard Sam talking about his jobs and his likes and dislikes uh, regarding jobs. So I'm going to ask you some questions about Sam. How old is Sam? Okay. Another question for you. Is Sam tall or short for his age? Right. And what colour is Sam's hair? Okay. And is Sam's hair long or short? Straight or curly? We could even ask our talented artist students to draw us a picture of Sam. By doing activities like this, before and after listening, we can develop good habits like predicting content and identifying and thinking about clues that speakers give about themselves when they speak. And very importantly, we give students the opportunity to use their imagination. There's no right or wrong answer. Sam is how you imagine him. And your Sam might be very different from my Sam. Once students have listened to Sam, they can make sentences about the boy and girl in the pictures in B. This time we have pictures but no names. So again, I'd ask my students to use their imagination. What's the boy's name? And the girl? What's her name? It's not Sam, no, we had Sam talking about his preferences. These are different. Okay, we've had Sarah a few times, so let's call the girl Sarah. And the boy. Uh, let's go. Let's go with Peter. Okay, so we've got Peter and Sarah. Okay, this is Peter. Peter is thinking about two jobs. Which two jobs is 
Peter thinking about. Yes, he's got two jobs in mind, hasn't he? A singer or a doctor. Now, Peter hasn't decided to be a, a doctor or a singer, so he would say, all right, I might be a singer or I may be a doctor. Now, Sarah has decided, she's chosen her job. Which job will Sarah do? What will she be? An astronaut. I'll be an astronaut, is what Sarah says. Again, we could ask students to say what's good about being a singer a doctor, an astronaut. And then students can draw their own hair, eyes, mouth and nose and then complete their own sentences about the jobs that they may, might or will do. They use the language to talk about themselves. This personalization of language is essential so that students can see that it is relevant to them. It's useful for them. Now, maybe one of your students wants to be an astrologist. Give them the word astrologist. Another would like to be an architect, the lead singer of a band, an electrician. Teach them the words that are useful for them, for your students. Now, here are my sentences for the jobs that I thought I might do when I was 11. Now, when I was 11, I didn't want to be a teacher. Wow, a bit surprising, seeing that I love my job. Being a teacher is great. Why? Well, both my parents were teachers and everyone was always asking me, what would you like to be, a teacher? So I got fed up and I got so fed up that I started saying, no, I won't be a teacher. So if we can involve students in the activities that we're doing by giving them opportunities to use the language to talk about themselves and the people they know by asking them to use their imagination, by asking them to, to if they agree or disagree that, for example, being an ambulance driver is a difficult job, and by asking them to give their opinions about jobs they would, would or wouldn't like to do, then the language we are teaching will be more interesting, more useful and more meaningful. For me, my key tip would be always include opportunities for students to use their imagination. So when we're deciding what to teach, we should ask, 
is it relevant for my students? Can they use it to talk about themselves or people that they know? The students I had in mind when we listened to Sam and talked about Peter and Sarah were aged around 11 and had an A2 level of English. But a six or seven year old student may never have thought about what jobs they would like to do one day. And they wouldn't have the language to talk about jobs they might, may or will do. For them, it will be more relevant to talk about the jobs that the people that they know do. For example, my mom's a doctor. Or about their favourite stories or books. Now, when young learners start learning English, the logical place to begin is with words for the objects and people and places around them. Family, homes, school, friends, toys. These would be the topics where the words would come from when we teach students aged six, seven or eight. The word lists for the Cambridge English Young Learners tests for starters include words from these topics. Now things like clothes and classroom objects are usually easy to teach because students are wearing them or they can pick them up, they can point to them, they can touch them. Now here we can see words and pictures from different topics that we usually teach young learners. Which topics do these words come from? Type the words for the topics in the chat box, please. Yes, we've got toys, clothes, parts of the face, body, animals, party objects, technology that they may use, yes. Okay, yes, so these words come from the body and face, clothes, animals, toys, home or school. Now, in this exercise, students have to put a tick in the boxes for the sentences that are correct for the picture and a cross for a sentence that is not correct. Which boxes here should have a cross? Yes, boxes three and box four should have a cross put in them. Sentence four says, this is a cake, but we can see a balloon. Both these things are things that you might find at a birthday party. And what's the problem with sentence three? What can we see in the picture? Yes, we can see a game, a board game. And the word in the sentence is name. The first letter of this word is different. Noticing small spelling differences like these is important. One letter can change the meaning of a word completely. 
as the young learners learn more words, they will learn that other words that are similar to, the, sorry, that they, they will learn other words that are similar to gain a name. Words that have a different first letter. For example, same, came. So as teachers, we can train them to look out for these things when they are reading or adding new words to the words they know. Students could ask each other these questions. It will help them remember name and game and make the words more meaningful and more relevant for them. They could go on and do a project or a survey, find out the most popular game for their class or in their school. Now, we can see here that the words in A and B are quite simple and it's easy to show meaning by using pictures of the objects we want to teach or practice. But another thing that students need to know and to notice is that words can have more than one meaning. Look at the mouse here. Is it an animal? It isn't an animal, is it? A mouse can be a small animal that runs fast and it can be something you use with a computer. Making young learners aware of this, that the same word can have different meanings, is an important part of learning English. Learning English is not just about learning new words, it's also learning new things about words you know. What's the word? Here we can see some sentences with uh, the two meanings of mouse. Mouse can be a very small animal and it can also be something that we use with a computer when we want to navigate or move around the screen. What about these sentences? Which word are they describing? That's right. Both of these sentences are about letters. A, B and C are letters and you write and send a letter to someone to tell them your news. And what about these sentences? That's right, we're talking about glasses. Glasses are something that you wear to see or read better and you can also put them, put uh, things like juice inside glasses and drink from them. Now I have a Pinterest account and one of my boards, my collections of pictures, is of words like mouse, letters, glasses that have different meanings. You could do the same for, for your classes or ask your students to draw pictures and make posters or make a picture, picture dictionary. For example, a computer mouse in the shape of a mouse. Some glasses that you can drink through. I've actually seen some of those in a shop 
They were made of plastic. They had a huge long straw that went round your eyes in your glasses and you could drink from it. Letters inside a letter. So making students aware that the same word can have different meanings is both important and useful. The next step, of course, is to help them remember these meanings. I just mentioned the computer mouse and the drinking glasses and the letters in the letter. These visual rep representations can help our students understand and remember these meanings. Have you ever wondered why a computer mouse is called a mouse? I wondered, I did. I went on the internet to find, try and find out where the name for the computer mouse came from. And what do you think I discovered? The first computer mouse was made of brown wood and it had a tail. The tail was the wire or cable that connected it to the computer. Douglas Engelbart, the man who invented it, was the man who gave it its name. Encourage your students to use their curiosity to find out why things have the names they have, for example. And of course, so that the meanings mean something to your students, it is important to get them to talk about themselves using the words. So questions like the questions here, get them to talk about their mouse or their opinion of a mouse their favourite letter, the way people in their family keep in touch. Now, the words mouse, letter and glasses are all nouns, but sometimes the same word can have different meanings and it can be a different part of speech. Which word fits into all the five sentences on the slide? That's right, the word is light. So, light in the first two sentences was an adjective and we can contrast those meanings of light with their opposites, dark or heavy. In the next two, light was a noun. And in the last sentence, I'm going to light the fire Light is a verb. These are five meanings of the word light that young learners will probably come across quite early on. Making them aware of the different meanings and uses is an important thing to do. As I said before, in many cases, making progress in English might not mean learning totally new words but rather adding new information to words you already know. Now I'd like you to close your eyes. I'm going to say a sentence. I'd like you to imagine that you can see what I describe in the sentence. Ready? The light from the moon was very bright that night. I'll say it again. The light from the moon was very bright that night. Okay, now I'm going to ask you some questions about what you saw when I said that sentence. Was the moon big or little? Were there clouds in the sky? Were you inside or outside? Was it hot 
or cold? Was there a wind? Could you feel a wind at all? Maybe your answers to my questions will be very different, or maybe not. If the light from the moon was very bright, then the moon was probably big and there probably weren't any clouds in the sky that stopped you from seeing the moon. The reason I asked you to close your eyes, picture the moon and answer those questions was to make you feel the situation, to feel the temperature, to feel the wind, if there was a wind. For many young learners, using their senses will help them understand, associate and remember words. I asked you to use your logic to work out the meaning, the effect on the sentence or on the moon of the words light and bright. And take a look at the words in the sentence on the slide. Light, bright, night. Which three consonants do these words share? G H T. This is a famously difficult combination of letters to spell. How can we help? Well, we can do activities like this. We have words with the same spelling pattern together. We can make G H T posters like this one for words that share the same spelling patterns. And for remembering the order of GHT, the tip is write them in alphabetical order. So, involve students. Ask them to find out why a mouse is called a mouse. Ask them to make connections, to notice small differences like game and name, letter con letter words which contain G-H-T. So noticing, finding out and making connections are useful activities to include in our lessons with young learners, or in fact, I would say, in lessons with students of any age. Okay. And they can also learn and this is uh, again relevant and important for young learners, that in different parts of the world, the same thing again might have a different name or a different word for it. So here we have Tom writing to his American friend Pat. This is the first time they're exchanging letters and Tom lives in London, so he will use British English. And Pat is American, so when he writes back to tell Tom about himself, he won't talk about living in a flat because Pat lives in an apartment. And Pat doesn't live next to a sweet shop, he lives next to a candy store. Okay, so these different words that, go, that uh, mean the same thing, but they're used by different people. Okay. I'm just going to go forward to the final slide. Because I'd like to make sure that we have time for questions. Okay. But just to uh, basically 
pull the session together um, in that we've just I've just got some ways in which we can select words for our learners so that the words that we cover in our classes are useful and meaningful for them. I hope I've uh, shown that the context we choose to present or practice words should be relevant to their age, language level, and very important to their interests and their world. For me, involving students by asking them to experience words, to use their imagination, and to make connections is extremely important. If we do this, even at this young age, which some people might think is quite surprising, I believe you'll be developing important habits which will help your students enormously so that uh, they have these habits and they can apply them as they continue to learn English. So thank you very much for listening to me. And now we have some time for questions. Hi, thanks very much, Anne. That was really interesting. And um, yes, so we've, we've got some questions in already, but please everyone do make sure to, to send us some questions because we're always happy to, to have some more. Um, first question is from Christine Sutro Chandley who asks, when and how you introduce sentence construction with, with, the, with your learners? Well, sentence construction, right. Um, okay, one thing I would say that I would start right from day one of actually exposing my students to sentences. Um, when I was at school, I learnt Spanish and uh, quite intensively, really. Um, and the first year, the teacher I had, she never spoke to us using a full sentence in Spanish. So she would say things like, this is un lapiz. And what happened uh, the next year, we had a change in teachers and the teacher suddenly came into the classroom and spoke in Spanish, totally in Spanish. Uh, it was a shock to us all, I think. Um, but it, there was no doubt about it in my mind that that was the best way to be to to learn a language because you can pick up uh, language like that. And and I believe that by um, using complete sentences, that very often students will actually come out with complete sentences even without you uh, directly overtly teaching those sentences. So things like classroom language, can I go to the toilet? Um, maybe they would start with something like say again, and then uh, could you say that again would come later. Um, but I think right from the start, we sh students should be actually hearing complete sentences. Obviously our expectation from them would be to start with them probably answering and using single words and then progressing to phrases and then sentences. So I think it's a gradual thing, but right from the start, they should be hearing the, the words in a context. Thank you. Another question now, this time from Elena Bajolet, who says, um, I think it's partly a question, partly a statement. Um, I think it's really important to give them the possibility of sharing their ideas and it, it, it doesn't matter if you use your mother tongue at, at all. Do, would you agree with that, that, the use of the mother tongue? I totally agree. I totally agree with that. Um, uh, allowing them uh, to be able to express their ideas, to express themselves. And, and for us as teachers, uh, that's um, a great way for us to check whether they really understood and whether we've got the idea across, um, you know, the, whether they've understood the, the whole concept, uh, if you like, and the idea. So very, very important for them to do that. Obviously, not always to 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 lapse into their mother tongue um, to do something like that. But um, but yes, definitely. I think for us as teachers, it's very important for uh, for us to allow them to use their imagination and to to express themselves. Okay, thank you. Um, 
question that actually comes up quite a lot in uh, in all our webinars, um, no matter what um, age range we're talking about, um, is uh, how do you deal with um, uninspired learners? I actually had noticed noted down that question because I I, I spotted it as it came up. Um, Right. One one trick that I have that I think works very well sometimes is getting students to be somebody else. So um, today you're not answering as uh, Peter or Sarah. Today you are Peter's mum, Peter's younger brother, Peter's cousin. You are Rafa Nadal. You are Cristiano Ronaldo. You are uh, Katy Perry. Um, so getting them to become somebody else and answer as if they were that person. This sort of role play very often takes away the, the shyness and also uh, seems to, I think, create inspiration where it might not necessarily be. Okay, thanks. Um, question now from... Um... But from Jana Rova, who asks, um, do you use a, a dictionary or do you give them your own vocabulary lists? I would do both, actually. I, I believe that a dictionary is an extremely useful tool to have uh, in the classroom um, or an online dictionary. Um, I consider myself a linguist and I, I love dictionaries, so I would definitely encourage students to use dictionaries because then they can find words that are relevant for them, the words they need um, at a particular moment. I think that's uh, very important. Um, also to have well, my own or their own vocabulary lists, I think then gives them a sense of, well, where am I and where am I going? and what what do I know and what don't I know? I think having some kind of um, word list is very, very useful for everybody. Yeah, thank you. Um, question now from Teresa chavez Bruin, who asks um, about um, learners with special educational needs and whether you have any thoughts on how to make, um, how to help them enjoy these activities, um, particularly um, learners with a limited attention span, difficulties expressing themselves. Right, well, um, some of the activities we've seen have asked them uh, to, to use their senses and to think about different ways of maybe recording or, or expressing their imagination. So in that case, I would suggest that um, however those how, in whatever way those students can express themselves, I mean, it would be it would be different uh, for every student. I feel, but as far as possible, I would try and adapt the activity so that they could express themselves either by drawing a picture, writing a word, or moving. Um, and attention span, of course, um, I would be try. I would always make a point of changing activities, doing different activities, um, especially with the, in the young learners classroom. That has to be uh, quite often, quite frequent. Um, so that that's what I would do. Um, I would be very sensitive to each case and also uh, the situation, and try and adapt um, my activities as far as possible. Thank you very much. Um, question now on uh, grammar concepts. Do you have any general tips for, for teaching grammar concepts to, uh, to young learners, please? Right, well, um, I do most of my teaching in Spain and have done much of, a lot of my teaching in Spain. Um, so I am, I tend to, yes, I do, uh, teach grammar or talk about grammar um, because students in Spain will be, will be have, have their own language to refer to and they will have a lot of grammatical concepts or ideas if you like um, to, to relate to um, at this age. So I'm not, it's not something that I um, don't bring 